The first thing we need to do is determine what we want to use for our cylinder. What are we going to mount our, our chicken plucker or picker, I guess technically they're pickers, fingers to? Now, I wanted thin wall six inch PVC pipe, the sewer pipe that used to be used for the stand pipes, for the clean outs for septic systems but they're seldom used anymore and that material is getting a lot harder to find. I know it can be ordered online, but then you pay shipping and everything else. Our local supplier was out of stock and they, <laughs> they just haven't gotten it in for several weeks. And you know, I used to be able to buy it by the foot. $1.69 a foot, I could get two feet and you know, for under four bucks, I'd have what I needed. But it's not available, at least in the time I need. So I ended up getting this riser pipe, which is more the, the Schedule 40, which is thicker. So that presents another problem since these fingers, the slot is, is about an eighth of an inch. And the thin wall pipe, all you have to do is drill your three quarter inch hole and pull it right through and you're all good to go. But with this, I'm going to have to drill out a countersink area, a flattened area with a larger bit. And we'll talk about that in a minute. So the first thing we have to do then is determine what we want. Do we want four inch? Then you can get thin wall. It's easy enough to find everywhere. Or six inch. I wanted six inch because I wanted a little larger diameter to slow that rotation down just a little bit. Our uh, purchased one had an eight inch drum or cylinder and that was steel. But that was only 12 inches wide. I think I'm going to go 18 inches. So we're going to have to cut this thing. I'm going to carefully cut it on the miter saw. And I think I'll cut off an 18 inch piece. And then we'll look at how we go about drilling our flattened area that will reduce the width of this pipe so that we can mount our fingers. So what I did, I, I lopped off six inches on the miter saw. The key is to make a nice straight cut. You know, I can only cut halfway through and then flip it over and cut the other half and try to, try to make sure it's nice and straight and square and run over it with the orbital sander if you need to, to square it off. And then I needed to divide this cylinder into six equal lines. So I found the radius which was, or I'm sorry, the diameter, which was six and a quarter. And so I measured across and then I measured the radius on each side to make sure each side then was three and an eight. So once I had these two lines, I, I just put a line on the edge and then I laid this against the rip fence on my table saw and then I, I squared off the end of a two by four and I just used that then as my straight edge and I drew a line and then I went on the other side directly across and I, I drew that line. So I had this thing divided in half, two equal sides. And then I wanted each side divided by three. So what I did is I just used a piece of plastic strapping and I found, I measured from one side to the other and it turns out that, you know, half of the circumference, so the circumference is 20 inches, kind of handily, half of this was 10 inches. So I just divided then 10 10 inches here I marked, divided that into thirds so that it ends up being 3.3333333 inches. So basically each segment is three and five sixteenths. So I just marked that on there and then I put this back up there and then just marked on the ends where that line would be and then I did the same on the other side. And then once I had my lines on an end, I just went back to my straight edge. And I drew my lines. So I divided this cylinder into six equal segments. 
And then to position the fingers, I wanted them basically three inches apart on each line, but I wanted them on centers. So on this line, I went measured down three inches, you know, just three, three inches, three, six, nine, 12, 16. You know, so I, I had five on this line. And then the next one, I put my first dot down an inch and a half and then three inches each and then ended up an inch and a half. So they're staggered. There'll be six fingers on that line, five on this, six, five, six, five. So it ends up being an, urban, an even 33 fingers on that cylinder. So, you know, I know those of you who are really good at engineering and geometry and, and all of that are gonna scoff at, at my technique, but I'm a seat of the pants product developer and that's how I did it and it works. And so now what we need to do is take this thing and we need to recess our holes in a little bit. So we thin that material out so that we can put our fingers in. Once I have all my holes marked, then we need to indent it, countersink it in a little bit at each one so that, that, that those fingers will seat. Now, I bought a, uh, a little stubby one inch spade bit. That thing wobbles all over the place and doesn't work. So I bought a Forstner bit, which is the same bit that we use for drilling holes in, in some of our planters and boxes. It's for drilling nice flat holes. Comes in a package looking like this, one inch. This one was $8.99, you know, nine bucks. They're stubby, so they'll fit into the drill press. It really works best in a drill press because you have control over it then. And even with my tiny little drill press, I have enough room to get the six inch pipe underneath. So the other th nice thing about a drill press is once you find your depth, you're basically taking about an eighth inch off that hole. You're, you're going in about an eighth of an inch. So you just set the depth gauge so that it, it'll stop at that point. And then you get some pretty uniform holes. The only thing you, you have to control a little bit is the cutting on each side of that hole you know, and you can kind of turn the pipe as it's cutting so it can dig evenly on each side of your hole. So we'll drill a couple here and just give you an idea of how that works. So as it goes into the plastic you can see you want it to hit the plastic on each side about evenly. So you can just, just turn that pipe one way or the other to guide it, kind of driving it. Just to cut yourself a nice flat clean hole. The nice thing about these Forstner bits is they're the best at at cutting a nice flat hole. So I'll go ahead and finish these off and then we will drill our three quarter inch hole to insert the fingers. I finished with the uh, Forstner bit and I got everything all sunk in here and made all my, uh, all my PVC confetti and so the next thing we're going to do is drill out the three quarter inch holes that are going to have the fingers in them. And I'm going to use a step bit. Now these are really handy for drilling through plastic and you can you know, keep stepping up there in increments. And you know, they're made for metal. You know, a lot of times electricians will use these because they can have one bit and they can drill out different holes through sheet metal or thin metal. 
and they can be a little pricey but I ordered these online and I got a whole set for <laughs> they're pretty cheap but I'm never going to use them on metal so they last pretty well but we really like them for drilling into plastic so I'm going to go ahead and drill out one of these Now I'm going to go sometimes maybe just one notch past three quarter, which is, gosh, 13 sixteenths. Um, I'm going to try, I just start to get into that 13 sixteenths. I'm going to really kind of try not to do that, but it's a little tricky getting these fingers in and there are people that make a puller for them and all that but you know since I'm late I'm resourceful with my time I'm just gonna put a little bit of soapy water I just put a couple squirts of dishwashing liquid in a little bit of water and I'm going to put that around and then what you want to do is pull it so that you get one side started. Well, I got <laughs> I got them all in except for the last three, so I thought I'd let you come along with me here as I do these last three, just so you can see what I've been up to here. If this is something you <laughs> want to tackle or not. So I never did drill these out past three quarters. That first one I kind of did a little bit, but since then I just went right up to the three-quarter. And I just put a, a black, I use a marker, and I mark on the 13 sixteenths so I know not to go up to that. So the three-quarter step is just below that. It's kind of a, a handy little guide there. So I'm still using just a little bit of soapy water I think that helps so what I do then is I just look down and I get the one side in get that kind of started and then just get the other side in so Two more to go. I'm a little concerned that I I set that Forstner bit a little bit deep, deeper than it needed to be. So I hope none of them pull through. But if they do, I'll just make another one. But if I do, if I have to make another one, I don't think I will. I think they'll be fine. Uh, most of the force is out. But if I do, I think, I think I'll look for thin wall. This is so much more work to use this thicker walled PVC where with the thin wall all I would have had to have done is put my lines on and, and mark where I needed to drill and just drill three quarter inch holes and be done with it. And it was a little bit hard with that Forstner bit on the drill press and drilling through a pipe and everything else. Not an exact science. I'm not exactly a precision shop. So, you know, some got a little bit deeper than others, but I don't know if you can see that, but I get one side of that, that groove 
in or close to being in and then just pull it the other way and you hear it snap 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 now they're all in so that's what it looks like I don't know, maybe if I was doing 30 pound turkeys or something, maybe one or two might pull through, but I think they'll be okay. So what I did is I cut out a disc of three quarter inch plywood and I found the center and I cut this out on the bandsaw and then I just did the same method that I do for my the octagon is it an octagon or a hexagon octagon composter to I use a big washer this is a 7 8 I think a washer that's big enough to not interfere with the movement of this bearing but then I use some lock nuts and these are just number 10 bolts that I just bolted that to this so that washer just that pressed in wheelbarrow washer won't go anywhere I think I have one laying around here somewhere yeah so these <laughs> now they're just the wheelbarrow they're ball bearings but they're just a press in bearing and they're certainly not made to run at high RPMs. And I'm sure the, you know, the people that know this stuff will say, look at that idiot, what he's doing now. Um, but I'm going to grease these up a little bit. I have some food grade grease that I use. And I'm going to grease the bearings up a little bit. And if we keep this in perspective, this thing is going to run about a half an hour a year <laughs> it takes about less than 30 seconds to clean a bird and I only have 20 some to do so you know you do the math it really doesn't run that much and so I don't want to invest a hundred dollars or, or more on something that gets used for less than an hour a year if I was doing a hundred or whatever, then I'd, I'd go ahead and get the big drum, the, the drum pickers, you know, with the big plate on the bottom that turns and you got fingers pointing inward. And I had a washing machine drum in the pole barn. I kept it for years and the motor from our old washing machine. I was going to build one of those until I finally realized, well, then I have to build a scalder that's going to do four birds at a time. I, right now I just use my my big pot and, and one bird at a time and it it just goes slick I can scald one bird at a time and pluck one bird at a time so if I was going to do many many more possibly but for our purposes a picker that'll just do one bird is fine with me especially when it's pretty inexpensive to make so after this will go in one end and I'll secure that with some screws and then on the other end I have another wash another uh, bearing in this disc of plywood and then I centered you know the best I can and it doesn't seem to really wobble much I centered a 10 inch pulley now I was going to fashion a pulley out of plywood and there was many of my 4 a.m. planning sessions that I was trying to come up with a way to make a a 10 or bigger inch pulley for, for hardly any money well I finally gave up and I just went online and I got a a blower pulley for residential evaporative coolers I actually got this online, delivered right in the mailbox, tax, delivery, everything else for $19. It's a nice aluminum 10 inch pulley for a half inch V belt. And I just, I set it over 
the bearing, so on this side I don't need a washer. But then I just drilled three holes in the body of the pulley and I just, I didn't put a spacers in there or anything else. I just let the, the bearing face kind of center it. And, you know, I just used some lock, lock nuts on there and it seems to be pretty well centered and straight and I'll just attach that to one other end of it. And then, then you need a motor. And I see some people use a, a drill and uh, I just didn't want to spend a lot on a motor. So I got this one. I just temporarily plugged it in just to make sure it works. This is a quarter horsepower, 1700 RPM, the same size motor that's on the picker that we had, our purchased one, commercially made one, and it already came with a pulley. So I just went to a, a heating contractor and they have all kinds of old squirrel cage blowers and motors and pulleys and luckily I know the people and, and they said, ah, just go dig through there and just take it, you can have it. So I <laughs> got it for free. So if you can get a motor for free, you can get a, 50, a bag of 50 fingers for 15, 20 bucks or something, and a pulley for under 20, and a V-belt for 6.99. This was seven, eight bucks or something. And then I'm gonna make a plywood stand. I don't have very much invested in this, so hopefully it'll work okay. But I'm going to wait till tomorrow before I do any more and put this thing together. I'm, I'm kind of woof from pulling fingers through the holes. Now, as you can see, I've been busy since uh, we, I did the last filming. I built this stand that's going to hold this thing. So I think what I'll do is I'll just take you around on a little tour of this thing and, and show you how I built it, what the dimensions are, and then what we're going to mount on it. If you recall, I went with an 18 inch cylinder. So by the time I mounted the pulley on the end, and then added a little bit of length so I had a 24 inch axle, a rod that goes through, I ended up with a total length of 24 inches. Now this what I used is just a solid three-quarter inch cold rolled steel. I got this from a, actually a steel business in town, which you have to buy it in 12 foot lengths, but it's substantially less expensive than going to the, to the building supply store and getting a length. But I only needed two feet. This is actually from a, a, an old composter design that I took apart because it didn't really work too well. So I just lopped off the extra. So since that's 24 inches total, my stand is 24. And then I figured I wanted enough width that it would certainly you know, clear the fingers, but I didn't want so much so that you know, chickens would fall in between there and such. So I ended up with a, a 15 inch width between here. So I cut two two by fours, 15 inches, and then I cut two pieces of three quarter inch plywood that were eight inches high by 24 inches. And then just used a uh, waterproof wood, uh, wood glue and glued and screwed the plywood to the 15 inch two by fours which left four and a half inches above. And then I, my legs, I figured a good height would be about like that. So these are 30 inches cut on a 20 inch, or I'm sorry, 20 degree bevel. So that's a 20 degree 
and then I put them on the outside you know as far as I could get them so I could maximize the stability and then I just had some scrap one by three or whatever just some scrap wood so I I braced them these are all glued too so I braced those the reason the braces are up high and not down low is only because that's how long my wood was and I didn't want to have to get more so that's what I used and I'm sure it'll be fine. And then this is a brace that's going to support the motor and that again is you know 24 inches. So I found where this wants to be based on the length of my belt. So this is a 46 inch half inch V belt and then with my motor I set my cylinder on there and put the belt on and then the motor and I just kind of guessed where that motor should hang. So that motor luckily for me it had a bracket on it when I got it from the the heating supplier. So you know that was free. So I just attached a piece of plywood to that bracket, a piece of three quarter inch plywood. And then I'm just using two door hinges. And so I'll attach those so it'll hang on to there. And then for my shaft, I just took some three quarter inch poly water line, same stuff that's on the bottom runners of the chicken cage. And I cut those to length just to serve as spacers so the thing isn't going to travel side to side. And then I shot some of this lithium grease, which is USDA approved for poultry facilities. And anyways, I used to use this on my, my uh, sausage stuffer and uh, uh, food grinder and stuff when I had a, when we had Turtle River pasties. But I lubed up those bearings with that grease and I lubed up the shaft so I know these bearings will probably they're loose enough they'll probably act more like a bushing than a bearing at times so they'll just spin on the shaft but again I know it's not the bearing to use for high speed situations but yeah you can't beat the price you know, you get two of them for four bucks. And again, let's keep things in perspective. This will only be used by us for roughly a half an hour a year. We're not going to be using this thing, running it continuously for hours at a time. So time will tell, but I think it'll hold up adequately for our purposes. So we'll put this thing together and we'll get back. Okay, you ready for this? <laughs> uh, well, it, it doesn't fall into my dumbest ideas category. It, it's not right at the very top of one of my better, best ideas, but I think it'll work all right. Well, let's take a look here. Now, it seems to run about maybe slightly faster, but about at the speed that our, uh, our commercially made one worked. Now the problem I had when I first plugged this thing in is that because I'm dealing with plywood and pipes and plastic and everything else, it's not a precision operation. So I had a little bit of off-centeredness to it. So, you know, the, the, the motor on the hinges meant that the weight of the motor supplies the tension to the pole, to the belt, but there was too much vibration. It was bouncing up or down, it worked. But what I did is I just stuck an extension spring on here. So I'll unhook the camera, we'll take a walk around this thing. As you can see down here, hopefully, I just 
I had an extension spring. I just added that. I just added a a, a one hole strap from conduit onto the the motor base, and then just to a screw head. So you know, it it's bouncing some. But our commercially made one bounced a little bit too, and that pulley wasn't exactly centered. But, you know, it's... I think it'll take the feathers off. So a few things I need to do yet. I need to make some kind of cover over the motor so that it doesn't get wet and full of feathers and everything else. I need to put a switch on this. I want a switch that I can turn this thing off and on. That's something our commercial one didn't even have. We just had to plug it in and unplug it. My temporary wiring there, I shouldn't even show you that. And then I think what I want to do is cut some PEX tubing on top to have a, a little plastic ledge on the top where the chickens are going to lay across, their bodies lay across there as, as the because their feathers are being removed, so I'll get those things done and that should be about it and we'll be ready to put this thing to use tomorrow morning. Just for, for perspective here, I'm going to show you the commercial picker that we have, plucker. So this one is, the concept is pretty much the same. The motor is down on the bottom and it's hinged and it just floats free but because it's it's machined and it's the pulley is on mounted to the shaft which sits in bearings it's different from mine and then the drum or cylinder is welded there's a strip welded and welded to that shaft which has you know the bearings sitting here so so it runs smoother than mine does this cylinder is 12 inches wide and 8 inches in diameter so it has I think probably about the same number of fingers all in all but I didn't count them but anyways I just thought it would be be kind of uh, Kind of interesting to see a commercially built one for those of you interested in making one of these don't and don't want to go my route with the <laughs> with the wheelbarrow bearings pushed into a piece of plywood if you're going to spend money buying a motor you probably want to go this route and go with a, a shaft that is house that is through some real bearings and that the the drum is is permanently connected to the shaft and then the pulley has a key on it and then that is affixed to the shaft too so that the pulley turns the shaft anyways I'm off to town to get some switch material and we'll fire my contraption up again in a bit so there you have it <laughs> A uh, chicken plucker for about yeah, 50 bucks, kind of running in that price range here. So I just went and I just got an inexpensive box, put a switch on it, wired it in, put a short section of wire and then I, an outlet. And you know, this is not waterproof or anything by any means. It's the cheap everything. But everything we have out here is on ground fault circuit interrupter the whole workshop every outdoor outlet and everything else so I'm not concerned like I say our commercial one to get that on and off we had to plug it in and unplug it and all wet around there and everything else I thought that was probably a little riskier than this but anyways the other thing I did is I I threw a shield over over the motor and I didn't want to spend much time on that and I'm sure we could do better but I just cut a a piece of uh, trim coil <laughs> the same stuff that I used to make the octagon composter just the two foot wide the white aluminum trim coil I just cut a one foot wide piece screwed it in put a fold at the top and bent it over I didn't even bother attaching the other side so it flaps around and makes lots of racket 
kind of like the heat shield on your car you know that sounds terrible but it's really not doing any harm but anyways that's just a, a cheapy thing to do and uh, again it makes some racket but I don't think I, I don't mind the chickens by that time they don't mind so here we go oh the other thing I did is I put I cut three quarter inch PEX pipe lengthwise in half on the uh, bandsaw and I just screwed that to the top. Why? I'm not quite sure. I, I wanted something, you know, kind of cover up that the ends of the plywood. And uh, even though I sealed it pretty well with water seal, and I'll show you that actually, I'll grab that real quick here. But I, I you know, I just thought it's a nice, a cleaner surface because the chickens are going to be laying on top of that. And maybe I just kind of like the color scheme. I don't know. I'll grab that uh, seal and show you what I put on this. This is the product that I've been using on, on our raised beds. And I, I used it on that last chicken cage that I made. And it's, it's, it really uh, beads the water up. How long it'll last, I don't know. I'm sure it has to be reapplied, but good stuff. I, I really like it. I, I enjoy using it. And I, you know, again, this is all just pine. And so I treated everything with it. And it's not gonna sit outside or anything. So here's my, my uh, rails on top. And so, oh yeah, one other thing, I guess since talking about that trim coil, I gotta make some, some uh, killing cones or what uh, my kids called them, the cones of silence. Well, that's another video. So, this is Mark again with back. Oh, you know what? You know, people are probably going to ask, why in the heck did this guy bother to make this chicken plucker when he already had one that's better, probably, arguably more sturdy and everything else? You know, my wife, she asks those kind of goofy questions too. Well, I did it so I could make a video like this to show that it's possible to make a decent chicken plucker for 50 bucks. But we'll find out tomorrow how well it works. So until then, this is Mark again with Backwood Basics. And let's grow together. and just hit that again until the little red light goes off. Oh. <laughs>